look at the ending of the round and the gradual training. Here amongst a Tathagata will appear in the world, accomplished and fully enlightened in sending me back to 27. So too, Brahman, here a Tathagata appears in the world, accomplished and fully enlightened. Perfect in true knowledge and conduct. He is sublime, a knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. Remember Angulimala. Teacher of the gods and humans, enlightened and he's blessed. He declares this world with its gods and its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people which he has himself realized with direct knowledge and seen. He teaches the Dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing and reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Then a householder or a householder's son or daughter or one born in some other clan hears the Dhamma and on hearing the Dhamma acquires faith in the Tathagata. And if you go to 140, Sutta number 140 is the story of the potter shed. And who was in the potter shed? Someone who left where he was as a prince in another country and gave up his kingdom and took on the ascetic dress and said he was a student of Gotama when he had never met him. And leaves his country in search of Gotama. And he comes to find the potter shed one night and Godama knows what's going to happen. He sees him in his mind and knows he has the potential to be an Arahad. And so what happens is he immediately goes there, immediately meaning jumping in the earth and coming out over there. And he's at the potter shed that night and asks to sleep there also. At which point he goes in the potter shed with this man and he teaches him the Dhamma. I'm not going to tell you what happens, but it's not so great what the end of the story is, except that he learned the entire Dhamma and before the end of the story becomes an Arahat. Okay? So I'm not going to tell you the whole story. Possessing such a faith, he considers thus, household, household life is crowded, even the life in the palace was crowded. And it's dusty. The life gone forth is wide open, unless you help the dog and heal it and keep it for a year, then it's not easy. <laughs> Okay, it is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and my beard. I put on a yellow robe and I go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or a large circle of relatives, he shaves off his head and beard. He puts on a yellow robe and he goes forth to the home life, from the home life into homelessness. And having gone forth and possessing the monk's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing living beings. With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious and mercifully abides, compassionate to all living things. Abiding the taking of what is Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Taking only what is given and expecting only what is given, but not stealing, or he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy. Living apart, abstaining from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to the truth, is trustworthy and reliable. One who is no deceiver of this world, abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech, and he does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people. This is slander from these people. Nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide these people from those people. And thus he is one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of friendship, who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, 
delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear, lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by many, agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip and speaks at the right time. He speaks what is fact. He speaks on what is good. He speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. At the right time, he speaks such words that are worth recording, reasonable, moderate, and beneficial. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating only one meal a day abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time. He abstains from dancing and singing and music and theatrical shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, smartening himself with scent, embellishing himself with unguents, and he abstains from high and large couches. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. He abstains from accepting men or women slaves and abstains from accepting goats and sheep, abstains from accepting fowls and pigs. He abstains from accepting elephants, cattle, horses, and mares. He abstains from uh, uh, accepting fields and land. <coughs> he abstains from going on errands and running messages. He abstains from buying and selling, abstains from false weights and false metals, false measures. He abstains from accepting bribes, deceiving, fraud, defrauding, and trickery. He abstains from wounding, murdering, binding, brigandage, plunder, and violence. <laughs> I hope so. Okay. Uh, he becomes content with his robes to protect his body, with alms food to maintain his stomach. Wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these things with him. It's just as a bird. Wherever it goes, it flies with its wings as its only burden. So too the monk becomes content with robes to protect his body, alms food to maintain his stomach, Wherever he goes, he sets out, taking only these with him. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, he experiences himself a bliss that is blameless. On seeing a form with the eye, he does not grasp at its signs and features. And since it, if he left the eye faculty unguarded, even unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. And he practices the way of its restraint by letting go and guards the eye faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty. And on hearing a sound with the ear or smelling an odor with the nose or tasting a flavor with the tongue or touching a tangible with the body or in cognizing a mind object with the mind. In all cases, he does not grasp the signs and features. And since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil and wholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint, right effort. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty by understanding the knowledge of how it works, you see. Possessing this noble restraint of faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied and a headache if he's not understanding it and he's trying to do it very hard. You see the difference? He becomes one who acts with full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking away and looking ahead, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robe and carrying his outer robe and bowl, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food, and tasting. Who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating. Who acts in full awareness when walking, standing, sitting, falling asleep, waking up, talking, and keeping silent. 
And possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, this noble restraint of the faculties, possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resorts to a secluded resting place, to the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space or a heap of straw. On returning from his arms round after his meal, he sits down and as he sits down, setting his body erect and establishing observation before him, abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness, purifies his mind from covetousness, abandoning ill will, hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings, he purifies his mind from ill will and hatred, abandoning sloth and torpor, he abides free from sloth and torpor, recipient of the light, mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sloth and torpor, he builds up his energy and his interest to get out of his sloth and torpor, okay? Abandoning restlessness and remorse, he abides unagitated with a mind that is inwardly peaceful. He purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse. Abandoning doubt, he abides, having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states, he purifies his mind from doubt. Having thus abandoned these five hindrances and perfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, then quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and abides in the first jhana. And with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana. And with the fading away as well of joy, then he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. And with the abandoning of pleasure or pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. And with this has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to ex growth in equanimity. And now the ending of the round and the full cessation. On seeing our form with his eye, he does not lust after it, if it is pleasing. He does not dislike it if it is unpleasing. He abides with mindfulness of the body, established with an immeasurable mind, and he understands as it actually is the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom. Deliverance by understanding the operation of the dependent origination by understanding human cognition. Wherein those evil and wholesome states cease without remainder. Having thus abandoned favoring and opposing, whatever feeling he feels, whether pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful, he does not delight in that feeling, welcome it or remain holding to it. And as he does not do so, delight in feelings cease in him. And with the cessation of his delight comes cessation of clinging, grasping. And with the cessation of clinging, cessation of any habitual tendencies. And with the cessation of any habitual tendencies, the cessation of birth of any reactions, when you're talking about it the way we're talking about it. And with the cessation of the birth of any reactions, then it is the cessation of aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, which cease. And such is the cessation of that whole mass of suffering. On hearing a sound with the ear or smelling an odor with the nose or tasting a flavor with the tongue or touching a tangible with the body or cognizing a mind object with the mind. In all cases, he does not lust after these if they are pleasing, he does not dislike them if it is unpleasing. And with the cessation of his delight comes the cessation of clinging. And with the cessation of clinging comes the cessation of habitual tendency for reactions. With the cessation of reactions comes the cessation 
of the birth of more suffering. With the cessation of the birth of more suffering, the aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, grief, and despair will cease. And such is the cessation of this whole mass of the suffering. And the conclusion. Monks, remember this discourse of mine briefly <laughs> as deliverance in the destruction of craving. But remember, remember the bhikkhu sati, son of the fisherman, as caught up in a vast net of craving, in a travel of craving, for still we remember him. And that is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. <laughs>